This lecture is going to be about mass spectrometry. So mass spectrometry is one of the really hot fields now uh, in analytical chemistry and really in chemistry analysis in general. Um, and it's useful uh, because it allows you to identify a molecule uh, using its mass to charge ratio. So we're going to be talking about this uh, um, a lot in mass spectrometry. So I'm going to use this M over Z to mean mass to charge ratio. Uh, so if you can look at a mass to charge ratio, you can usually get a molecular weight um, of a species and it's good for identification. So it's been traditionally used for small organic molecules. So if you were an organic chemist, you wanted to know what you made, you might take it over to a mass spec. Um, uh, but the field today um, uh, uh, is really in the uh, biological samples. Um, and so if you were to go to a mass spectrometry meeting today, you would see that mass spectrometry has really opened up the whole field of proteomics. Um, there's lots of proteins. You can even do DNA, um, polymers, um, other things. So large biomolecules is really where the field is today. In this lab, we're going to do a ton with large biomolecules. We're going to do more with organic molecules. Uh, but a lot of the instrumentation is the same. Things you learn here, um, many students have told me, have been very useful when they go out to research labs um, uh, and they uh, see mass spectrometry. Okay, so before we get into mass spectrometry and the instrumentation, we've got to talk a little bit about um, mass spec uh, in general. And so we need to talk about the concept of masses in mass spec. And you say, oh, I know how to find a mass, right? You find it from the periodic table. You know, you look at the periodic table, and it's going to tell you what the mass of your ion is. Well, for mass spectrometry, you frankly never want to use the periodic table. And because I, my, mass spectrometry distinguishes between isotopes. So if you were to pull out the periodic table and look at the mass of carbon, it would tell you that the mass of carbon is something like 12.011. That's what the periodic table would tell you. But that is not a number that is an actual mass of any carbon atom whatsoever. It's really an average of the, of the carbon. So carbon 12 is defined as 12.000, as many decimal points as you could say zero. That is the definition of atomic mass. So this is, you know, you use AMU, atomic mass units, or Daltons, whatever you wish. They're the same thing. Uh, so that's the definition, right? But there's also, right, a carbon-13, right, that has a, um, um, a, a mass of 13. And this one, right, is in 1.1% abundance. So 1% of the carbons out there have a mass of 13. 99% would have a mass of 12. And so that's how we end up with an average mass of 12.011. But that does not mean that any carbon ever weighs 12.011. So in a mass spec, if we were going to look at carbon, we have, this is always, the, the y-axis is always relative intensity, how much we have there. The x-axis of a mass spec is always m over z. And again, we have a big peak for carbon 12 and a little peak, 1% of it, for carbon 13. So, um, the, but we get two separate peaks for just one thing. Um, and so that's really important to know when you're interpreting mass spectra. The, the size of that carbon-13 peak can let you know how many carbons you have in your sample. So that's actually pretty useful for identifying things. If it's 6%, that means you probably have six carbons uh, right, um, uh, that you're looking at. And so um, those are useful um, for looking at them. And lots of other things have um, isotopes as well, but carbon is particularly useful to look at. So just to know that you've got to use the exact mass of every, of, um, every um, carbon. If you get the right instrument in mass spec, you can actually do what they call exact mass measurements. And they can literally measure out to three or four decimal places. They are that good in mass spectrometry. Um, and that's particularly helpful to differentiate between things like N and, say, CH2. Nominally, if you just, you know, used your, your brain, you would say N is 14 and CH2 is 14. And how would I tell the difference between them? But in reality, N is 14.003074, and CH2, if you were to add it up, is 14. 
0.0156. Again, that's with a CH2 with a 12 isotope. And so with exact mass measurements, you can actually tell the difference between those things um, if you have the right um, instrument. That's not the instrument we have in our lab. It's not that good. Uh, it's not that well calibrated, I shall put it that way. Um, but people do that with mass spectrometry. So we're going to talk instrumentation now. What is under the hood, so to speak, of a mass spectrometer? What are the parts of it? Uh, and so I'm going to draw you a block diagram of a mass spectrometer. Uh, and it would go something like this. We have to wait to get it, have an inlet, a way to get our sample in. Once we get our sample in, we have to have a way to ionize it. So we have to have an ionization source. How are we going to analyze it, ionize it? Um, then, once we make it into ions, we have to analyze those by mass. So we have to have some sort of mass analyzer. And then those usually go to some sort of detector. And like everything in life now, right, it's all computer controlled. Let's not be kidding ourselves. This part of the mass spec that I just put in dashed lines is almost always done in a vacuum. There are some exceptions. Maybe you can ionize without being a vacuum. But we almost always detect in a vacuum. And the reason is this. We don't want the ions interacting. Yeah. Interacting with themselves or the air. So there's just too much floating around in air that our ions could interact with. We don't want them interacting with anything, so we pump it down, and almost all mass spec is done under vacuum. Um, uh, so we're going to look at that. So as we um, look at mass spec in, um, thing, uh, the instrumentation, the two biggies here are really the ionization source and the mass analyzer. And mass spec is a field full of acronyms. And the acronyms all go like this. They'll tell you the ionization source dash the mass analyzer. So if you're doing ESI dash quadrupole, you know, or ESI TOF, or even ESI TOF TOF, you know, or something like that, they'll tell you an ionization source and then a mass analyzer. And sometimes there's more than one mass analyzer. Um, and so if you can learn the abbreviations, at least you know how they're set up. We're not going to, this is not a comprehensive mass spec class, but I think it's interesting and useful to be um, uh, introduced to some of them. So we'll start with the ionization source. So there's really two different ways to do it. The one thing about mass spec is this. Everything must be in the gas space. If you can't get it into the gas space, you can't do it. Um, and so um, for the ionization force, there's kind of two different ways to do it. You can make a gas, and then you can ionize it. Or you can make gaseous ions from some sort of other sample, like a liquid or a solid. So you can do it all at once. So you can first make a gas, then ionize it, or you can just hit it and make gaseous ions all at once. You can do it either way. Um, so the most traditional um, ionization source, the very first one ever invented and still used quite a lot today, is called electron impact. And so this is given the abbreviation of EI for electron impact. Um, and so in this um, uh, um, ionizer, you'll have your sample, and it'll be coming in. Uh, and your sample will already be a gas. So you'll already have heated up your sample, and it's already a gas. Um, and once it comes in and it comes out of the tube, uh, what you're going to do as your gaseous sample comes out is you'll have um, some sort of electrode up here and you'll make electrons. 
And those electrons will be accelerated, and so those electrons will be going down um, in this direction. And those electrons are very, have a lot of energy. They have about a 70 electron volts worth of energy. So there's a super amount of energy. And so as your sample comes out, make our sample a little black dots, you know, uh, some of them will be hit by an electron, and that will cause some of them to ionize. Um, the most popular reaction that occurs for electron impact ionization is this, your molecule, which we'll call M, uh, plus an electron goes to M plus dot plus two electrons. And so that is a um, basically repulsion of an electron. When the electron gets close, it can repulse and cause an electron to uh, be extracted. And so we end up with a radical cation. Uh, and so this is our ion that we will later detect. Um, again, because your um, sample has lost an electron. So that's the most common reaction that happens. This reaction, though, isn't very common. Only about one in a million molecules that, that are hit with an electron are actually going to shoot out another electron and form an ion. So it's not efficient at all. Most things that go through your mass spec never get ionized, and you never detect them. OK, so once we make an ion, I've made my ion. Uh, there's um, some parts of the instrument that are down here, and these are basically, these are slits, and what they do is focus the ions uh, and send it to the mass analyzer. So everything in mass spec is an ion, it has a charge, and so you can play with it by just putting charges on plates and getting the ions to go where you kind of want to go. Lots of physics involved, actually, in mass spectrometry. All right, so let's look for a moment at 70 electron volts. Is that a lot of energy or not? You probably are not used to electron volts as a unit. So let's, this is the unit that every mass spectrometrist uses, but let's convert that into something that you might know. All right, so it's about 10 to the 6, 6 times 10 to the 6 joules per mole. Um, is sort of an equivalent. And so what we need to think about is what the bond energy is. You know what a, bond, a typical bond energy is? It ends up being somewhere in the range of 10 to the 2 to 10 to the 3rd joules per mole. So we're putting in 10 to the 6 joules per mole of energy as we hit this thing. And it only takes, you know, 10 to the 2nd, 100,000 joules per mole instead of a million. Uh, to break a bond. And so what happens is, in this case, we get lots of fragments because we break bonds. So with EI, sometimes you'll see the molecular ion, but sometimes you won't. What you do see is a lot of fragments because you've broken bonds. You've had enough energy to break bonds. Uh, and so breaking bonds is good and bad. Fragmentation, uh, each fragmentation pattern can be unique about a molecule, can tell you about structure. It also, though, makes it harder if you wanted to pick out the molecular ion and it's not there because it fragmented. It makes it harder maybe to figure out what the molecular weight is. This EI technique is called a hard ionization technique. And a hard ionization technique makes many fragments. So that's electron impact. Let's jump forward um, just a couple decades uh, and talk about another ionization technique. Electrospray ionization. So notice this still starts with E, but EI was taken because EI was already around. So electrospray is always called ESI, just so you know, um, uh, it, uh, because electro e, e was taken, uh, so to speak. Um, 
So for electrospray, our sample is going to come in through a needle. Um, so let's make draw ourselves a needle. Um, and this needle, our sample, is going to be a liquid. So our sample is flowing through a needle as a liquid, and then to that needle, we're going to apply a high voltage. So I'm going to apply a super high voltage to my needle. And so as the um, uh, sample comes to the end of the needle, what it's going to make are these really large charged droplets. So they're still going to have some solvent, and they're going to be highly charged. Let's think for a second. Do that many charges like to be in one droplet together? From physics, you would say, say no, right? Like charges repel. Uh, and so what happens is these charges undergo columbic explosions. I always like that term. Right? Too many charges of like kind together as they come up. And so they end up going to going to columbic explosions. And what we end up with are molecules now. And these molecules end up, they desolvate. So now they're in the gas phase. And these molecules can often be multiply charged meaning some of them may be a charge one, but some of them might be a charge of two or three or four, where you put multiple charges onto your um, uh, molecule. And so we now have you know, gaseous ions that we can accelerate down to a mass analyzer, uh, but this is different than electron impact, where you almost always just got one charge. In this case, you can get multiply charged ions. Now, there is sort of um, a good question, and that's a question I'm not going to answer uh, in this lecture. Uh, um, but there is sort of a question. In our lab, we're going to do electrospray um, for an LC experiment, but we're not going to get multiple charges. And so the question is, why? So think about that. It has to, I'll give you a hint. It has to do with the molecular structure of what we're looking at. But electrospray often gives you multiple charges. Um, and so if you look at an electrospray spectrum, that a mass spectrum uh, that you would get from electrospray, it's possible to get out, let's say, you know, this is like a protein or something. It's possible to get out multiple peaks. This does not mean you have multiple proteins. This is like a sample that would literally just be one protein. But each of these peaks is a different charge. So this might be, you know, plus six, and this would be plus five, and this would be plus four, and this would be plus three, and that would be plus two. Um, notice the lower the charge, right, the lower the denominator, because they all have the same mass, so the, the lower charges are to the right, the higher charges are to the left. Um, but again, for one compound, you can get multiple peaks. And so it makes electrospray just a little bit tricky um, to look at, uh, because um, you can get multiple peaks per analyte. Uh, and so typically, electrospray is coupled to a separation. And in fact, that needle I showed you, you know, it looks awfully easy to perhaps just put my LC column, right, directly into there. So this is the most popular method for coupling um, separations to LC. Um, and again, the only issue being that you get um, multiply charged peaks. 